2 Timothy 4, we're, we're one week removed from finishing 10 weeks on a book with like less than 90 verses. I want you to listen to the tone of triumph in Paul's words. He says, in the presence of God who judged the living and the dead and in the view of his kingdom and his appearing, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction because the time will come when men won't put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they'll gather around them a bunch of teachers who'll say what their itching ears want to hear. But as for you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry for I'm already being poured out like a drink offering and the time has come for my departure. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. There's a crown of righteousness in store for me that the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day and not only to me but also to all who have longed for his appearing. So af after this series of charges throughout this letter, Paul gives Timothy and us one central charge. That it, it just kind of sums the whole thing up. He says, preach the word. Hmm. And, and then he, he's going to give this series, of, this series of motivations that reinforce that chart. The first one's in verse 1. He says, in the presence of God and of Jesus who will judge the living and the dead in view of his kingdom and his appearing, I give you this charge. And what he's doing here is he's pulling back a curtain. He's, he's opening Timothy's eyes to an invisible spiritual world that's around every one of us every single day. You know that there is a spiritual world that is around us all the time. There is a war that is being waged at all times. There is a fight for your spirit, for your families, for your marriages, for your finances. There is a spiritual warfare that is happening at all times all around us. And Paul says, I want you to be cognizant of this. And then he reminds him that Jesus is going to someday judge everything that every one of us have ever done. He's going to assess all of our life's works. And he, he reiterates to Timothy what he had written earlier in 2 Corinthians, that we're all going to have to appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for the things that we have done in our body, whether they are good or whether they are bad. Huh. Isn't that like a wake-up call when you know that you're going to have to stand and give an account for every single thing you've said, every th single thing that you've done? Doesn't it provide a level of accountability? My daughter, she got her little job. She works at a kiosk, a coffee kiosk, and the coffee's good. It's, uh, donuts is better, but the coffee is good. And uh, just her that works in there, just one person at a time. And so our family takes turns pulling up. Every time she works, our family takes turns because we all want to not just get coffee, we all want to give her a tip. We don't know that we're all going. We just randomly show up. This, this kiosk that she works in, it has a camera that is on the window at all times. Uh, it's probably for safety, but I really think that it's for accountability. And so because there's a camera that is pointed at the window every time, we know we better not act a fool. We know when we come and we're family, we better not be trying to get free stuff. There's a level of accountability that happens when you know that you're going to have to give an account because somebody is watching. Now, now, if you're a Jesus person, when you die, you're not going to have to give an account for your sins. You're going to have to give an account for your stewardship. Jesus' people were free from having to stand before God to suffer condemnation for our sins. Jesus already covered that on the cross. But no one is free from assessment on the final day. Jesus' people are going to have to give an account for how we spent our time, how it is that we spent our spiritual gifts. And so he's saying, Timothy, be ready for that day. How? By preaching the Word. The word Pastor Dallas said last week is God breathed, literally exhaled by God. So he's saying, take that pure, perfect word and preach it. And when you preach it, preach all of it, not just the parts you like or the ones that support your opinions, lifestyle, or choices. Preach everything so that the body of Christ, the church, will be built up. I mean, for 2,000 years, God's been building believers and the church at large in this way, through the preaching of the word. So, so he says, bro, be ready, be prepared both in season and out. And those words, be prepared in season and out, literally in the Greek means be urgent. Have a sense of urgency when you're sharing 
God's word because we're not guaranteed a tomorrow. James, the earth, earthly brother of Jesus, he said, your life, it's just a vapor. It, it, it's a mist. It, it appears for a little while and then it just, just vanishes. And when you're young, you don't think that. But the older that you get, the more you realize life is short. There's something fascinating about when you get old. I'm getting there. I'm getting old. You know how I know I'm getting old? Sometimes I get injured just being. <laughs> you ever get injured just being? The other day I was walking, just doing nothing, just minding my own business. And all of a sudden my ankle's like, Kah! nope, psych. My ankle was like, I was like, I didn't do nothing. What happened? All of a sudden I was like, <laughs> and suddenly it's like, what's going on? I don't know. It's like I blew my ankle out. Doing what? Being. And the older you get, man, the faster time. It feels like it was 2002. It feels like we were just partying like it was 1999, doesn't it? No, it's like, what? How did we get old? I said to Aubrey and Sonny that they went to dinner last night. And I came out of the bathroom, and uh, not that you needed that image, but I uh, came back to the table, and I looked at these two girls, these two beautiful ladies. I said, hey, listen, my eyebrows are on point today. <laughs> so he said, you don't even look like you have eyebrows. What are you talking about? I go, exactly. There's none doing this. There's none doing this. It's just, they're... I'm feeling them right now. Like, it's just like you get old, you start getting hair where you don't want it and losing it where you do want it. And life just kind of, the older that you get, it feels like somebody put fast forward on the VCR. It's here for a minute, but then it just vanishes. And so because of that, you better be ready in season and out. Be urgent. Don't get caught out in the weeds. Don't get distracted in the issues of the day. And can I tell you from personal experience, that's not always easy or convenient. Contrary to popular belief, there is all sorts of stuff I want to camp out on. There is all sorts of stuff I want to comment on. But early in this letter, Paul said, keep the main thing the main thing. He said, be ready at all times to preach the word, God's word, not your word. Be ready to use it to correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Not with anger, not with angst, not with malice, not with revenge. And when you notice all of those directives that he used, they all involve words, which is so similar to what Pastor Dallas talked about last week. He said, all scripture is God-breathed and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. He's saying as you share God's word, what you're going to be doing in people's lives is the very thing that this book was created to do, the very thing that this book was meant to do. And that starts with correction. Remember the gyroscope illustration Pastor Dallas shared last week? That that's correction. The, the gyroscope, it was always true to the axis. If, if the ship turned or leaned one way or the other, the gyroscope told a computer to right the ship. That's the purpose of God's Word, to right the ship. And this is saying that that's actually what you and I, this is what Jesus people are supposed to do in the lives of every person around them. Correction. They're supposed to come along and say, hey, bro, man, like you're leaning a bit. You're leaning in the way that you treat your lady. or You're leaning in the, you, you know, when, you, when all you do is get on that computer and all you do is post this and comment on that, I mean, you're, you're leaning a little bit. It's our job to come around. And, and it's not our job to get on social media and yell at people about being on social media. Yes. That's like being in a car driving by getting mad at people that they're driving. Why? Why are we mad about everything? Why is it that... See, David said, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Salvation is supposed to be filled with joy. It, and that's like correction is arm around, hey, bro, like you're leaning a little bit. The problem is not a lot of us want to do that because it seems nosy. We don't want to do it. Let me retract that. We don't want to do it to people's face. 
Because it seems nosy, it seems invasive, it seems judgmental. We like to save our judgment not for people but about people. I'm just saying. We like, to, we like to share our judgment with somebody who has nothing to do with the situation because when we get infected, we like to infect somebody else. It's like, it's like you caught the monkey pox and you just determined, let me go sneeze in somebody else's face. Like you just want to infect everybody around you except the person who it is that you've developed this opinion. But guys, we need to bring correction to each other. I'm going to tell you, I, I, I want you to do that for me because I promise you I'm going to do it for you. And that's why Christianity requires tough skin. This is life or death. The decisions that people make in this life have eternal consequences. And if you and I can't take correction, how is it that we're going to take rebuke? You, you know, rebuke is what's needed when correction doesn't work. Rebuke is a locker room at halftime. So, sometimes the rebuke you hear in a locker room will make your ears ring. And for whatever reason, we accept it from a coach. And we accept it from a coach because, because we believe that a coach has our best interests at heart, that, that that coach ultimately wants us to win. And, but rebuke isn't just for coaches. It's for anyone who loves you. You should receive rebuke from anyone who loves you, from anyone who has your best interests at heart, from anyone who wants you to win. And the reason that this book, the Bible, is full of rebuke is because God wants you to win. I don't know if you know that or not. Sometimes it feels like people think that all God wants us to do is lose. They're like, that's why we have so many rules. That's why there are so many regulations. That's why this Christian life is so difficult because God wants us to lose. But ultimately, God wants you to win. And Jesus modeled that throughout the Gospels. Jesus rebuked people all the time. In fact, in Revelation 3.19, Jesus says, those whom I love... I rebuke and I discipline. So be earnest and repent. And, and, and I hope that that revelation doesn't blow your image of the gentle Jesus. Sometimes we picture Jesus like he's Krishna. Sometimes we picture Jesus like he's like, bro, hang. Like, Jesus wasn't having that. Jesus wasn't a hippie, he wasn't a beat, beat neck, and he wasn't smoking pot with his disciples sitting around talking about the goodness of the universe. Jesus was constantly rebuking the people he loved when he saw them in sin because he was shaping them, he was forming them to become more like him. And so because of that, he spoke the truth in love. The problem is our culture doesn't really value truth. Our culture values tolerance. Our culture values acceptance. But can I tell you that acceptance isn't always the most loving thing that I can do? Sometimes the most loving thing that you can do is correct someone. Sometimes the most loving thing you can do is rebuke them. Years ago, like 20 years ago, Pastor Sonny and I were going through a really rough patch in our marriage. And it was me. Like, I, I had a, a huge ego. I was traveling all over the world. I thought that I had become somebody. And I would, I would go to these huge events. And I would come home. And I would feel like everybody at the house should wait on me and cater to me like the people at the events did. And it created this, like chasm between Sonny and I, and I'm already a naturally aggressive person, and so I, I wasn't talking to her the right way, I wasn't treating her the right way, and I got really sick, and I was in the hospital for like six weeks, and I, I had a, uh, an emergency surgery, and when I woke up from my anesthesia, sitting at the foot of my bed was my best friend, Alan Griffin, and he confronted me. He flew in to confront me. And the reason that he flew in is because he thought I was about to die. And he wanted to not just correct me, but to rebuke me, to give me an opportunity to bridge the gap between my bride and myself before I potentially died. If he didn't love me, he'd have just let me act the way that I was acting. If he didn't love me, he would have just let me keep being a jerk. It wasn't hurting him one bit. And that's what Paul's talking about here. Correct, rebuke, and encourage. I wonder when's the last time you encourage someone. You know encourage means to add value to, right? So I wonder when is the last time you 
added courage to someone's life. When's the last time you caught someone doing something right and you celebrated them? We love to catch people doing things wrong and correct them, but when is the last time you caught somebody doing something right and you encourage them? And it doesn't mean they have to have just cured cancer. Like if your son picks up his laundry, encourage him. If your daughter rinses her dishes and puts them in the dishwasher, first of all, it is a miracle from God above. Encourage her. Mark Twain said, I can live a whole year on one good compliment. I wonder, are you like that? I mean, I mean, I know I am. Because here's the thing, the more you encourage someone, the more you can correct them. The more you encourage someone, the more you can rebuke them. So we correct, rebuke, encourage. Correct, rebuke, encourage. Correct, rebuke, encourage. It's a pattern. And we do that pattern with great patience and careful instruction. And we can't give up ever. Some of you have been married 27 years. Don't give up ever. And I know that it gets frustrating. But people are people. People do not change easily or quickly. And here's why. They're wounded. They're damaged. They have baggage. Stick with it. And as you're sticking with it, use careful instruction, which could be translated, keep telling them the truth. Because as Jesus said, the minute that they know the truth, the truth will set them free. So keep fighting. Keep working. Keep persevering. Keep grinding. Take every opportunity you can get. Why? Because the time is going to come when men won't put up with sound doctrine. They won't put up with the truth. So take advantage of it now while you have the opportunity because planting that seed will at some point hopefully come to harvest. There will, there will come a time and it feels, like we're, it feels like we're right there. I don't know if you live in the same culture that I live in, but it feels like we are on the precipice of living in a culture where people will not receive sound doctrine, where people just will not receive the truth, they, they just won't endure it. It'll be like a burden to them. Huh. I mean, let's be honest. For those who don't want to live a clean life, for those who don't want to change, this book, the Bible, is a drag. It's a burden. And so to soothe their own hearts, people are going to satisfy their own desires and by gathering people around them who will say what their itching ears want to hear. And, and we're not the first generation to do that. Like... 3,000 years ago, the children of Israel had become so rebellious, they, they wouldn't listen to any sound doctrine, and so God sends a prophet named Isaiah who said this. The Jews, they, see, they say to their seers, see no more visions. They're going to say to the prophets, give us no more visions of what's right. Tell us pleasant things. Prophesy illusions. Leave this way. Get off this path and stop confronting us with the Holy One of Israel. And man, if that doesn't sound like our culture. Our culture is full of people that don't want anyone to tell them that their choices, their lifestyles, that their identities are wrong. And so they surround themselves with people who will soothe their ears and tell them what they want to hear. And they gather as many of those voices around them as they can. They'll collect as many people who will validate them as they possibly can. Because at the end of the day, in their hearts, they know they're wrong. But if they can get enough people telling them that their wrong is right, maybe their wrong will magically become right. Maybe somehow the lie that they're living will somehow instantaneously become true. But a million people can tell a cat it's a dog, but that doesn't change the fact that it's a cat. And it can put the little rubber booties on when it rains, and it can wear a spike collar, and you can walk it out there, teach it to bite, and it can cock its leg on every fire hydrant that it walks by. He can, he can change his name to Fido, and he can bark like a Rottweiler. But can I tell you that you can tell that cat that it's a dog all you want, but at the end of the day, it will still be a cat because truth is not determined by committee. And so Paul says, don't tickle their ears. And, and this is what a lot of us love to do. We love, we love to tickle people's ears. You know why we love to tickle people's ears? Because most of us weren't cool in high school. 
And we're so frustrated, we're so tired of not being the cool kid that we will tickle people's ears and say what we think they want to hear. But can I tell you that at the end of the day, most people who are living in sin don't want you to validate their sin. They want you to tell them how to change. They want you to tell them how to not be living in sin. Paul says, don't tickle their ears. There's enough people doing that. And they're going to turn their ears away from the truth towards the myth, which is, uh, here's the interesting thing. When Paul says they're going to turn their ears away from truth toward a myth, in, in the Greek here, which the New Testament was written in Greek and translated into English, in the Greek, uh, there's a tone to that word. And the tone of that word, uh, there's a violence to it. The context of which Paul wrote this is saying that they're going to rip themselves out of the truth and turn towards something else. That, that they're going to jerk away from the truth and turn to myths. Have you ever seen a kid that doesn't want to go where their parents are trying to get them to go like a toddler or something, and that kid will rip their hand out of them? No, Paul's saying that's exactly what people are going to do. In fact, in the original context, he suggests that it's like a bone coming out of the joint. That's how people are going to act towards the truth. They're going to rip away from it. So Paul tells Timothy to keep his head in all situations, to maintain clear thinking. And the word here literally means keep clear of intoxicants. You ever get around a friend at wine o'clock? Ooh, they'll start saying some mess, won't they? They'll start saying things to you. They'll start letting out every secret. In the you ever see somebody on Facebook Live after they drank a half a bottle of wine and the, let me tell you what my husband did last night? You're like, oh snap, it's about to get loose in here right now. <laughs> but listen, loose lips sink ships. So keep your thoughts clear and be ready to endure hardship. Be ready to put up with difficulty as you do the work of an evangelist, which is just spreading the gospel. So as you continue to spread the gospel, Paul's saying, be ready to endure hardships. He says, discharge the duties of your ministry. And in that, there's this image that Timothy is like a cup, a cup that before he became a Jesus guy was empty. But when he became a Jesus guy was filled with a spiritual gift. And he was given opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to be poured out. And sometimes he was poured out as correction. Sometimes he was poured out as rebuke. And sometimes he was poured out as encouragement. And Paul tells him, now's your time, bro. I've already done this. This is your opportunity. I'm, I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. The time has come for my departure. And Paul was actually taking that image. It wasn't just like some random thing. He was taking this image from the Jewish sacrificial system where during a sacrifice, a small amount of wine was poured on the sacrificial fire. And the wine went in doses and it would hiss and evaporate so that the smelling fragrance of the wine would raise up. And it was poured in short little doses so that it wouldn't extinguish the flame, which is why Paul says it in the passive tense. He's saying, I'm being poured out, not I'm pouring myself out. And can I tell you, that's why I don't share my opinion on certain things. Because in my flesh, y'all, mm, I could easily come on too strong and extinguish the flame that God's trying to start in someone's life. And so I want Jesus to pour me out in spurts. He filled me up, and now it's his responsibility to pour me out. And when I am finally empty, he'll take me home. And Paul says, when I get there, there'll be a crown of righteousness waiting for me that the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me. Why is he going to do that? Because I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. I persevered. In 1904, a young man named William Borden, the heir of the Borden Dairy family, graduated from high school. And as a graduation gift, his parents gifted him a cruise around the world. I'm sorry, graduates, for your $30 gift card. <laughs> During the cruise, Borden traveled through the Far East and he became burdened by the sight of people who had these idolatrous worship systems and didn't know Jesus. And so he committed himself on that boat to being a missionary. And, and when he got back home, he spent four years getting his undergrad at Yale, then three years at Princeton Seminary preparing his life to be on the mission field. And while he was in school, he turned to the back of his Bible and on the last page he wrote the words, no reserves. And by writing the words, no reserves, he meant that he would hold nothing back. He'd give everything to God, no reserves. 
As he was finishing seminary and preparing to graduate, he started selling all his possessions, started giving away his incredible wealth. His family, they begged him. They said, we need you to run the dairy business. He refused. The mission field awaited. When he'd finally given away millions of dollars and gotten rid of all of his stuff, he turned to the back page of his Bible, and under the words, no reserves, he wrote the words, no retreat. He was saying, I'll never turn back. He was going ahead with the plans to become a missionary. On his way to China to share Jesus with Muslims, he caught cerebral meningitis, and he died within a month. The world, it grieved. Newspapers all over the world actually wrote about his death. It was a tragic loss. And one newspaper article said this, what a waste. If he'd just stayed in America, he could have done so much good here. A friend of his, he was tasked with retrieving his personal effects, and when he came across Borden's Bible, he opened it, and he found the writing on the back page. He found the words that he had written in college, no reserves. He found the words that he had written when giving away all his money, no retreat. But he also found some final words that he had written on that boat to China, and they were the words, no regrets. At the age of 25, William Borden died with no regrets because he'd given everything to Jesus. And that's the deepest desire for my life and for yours. That when we reach the end of our race, we'll have been poured out like a drink offering, having no regrets. That at the end of our lives, we can both say, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. I wonder if you can say that today. I hope you can. But if you can't, we're going to give you the chance to before you leave here. Would you close your eyes? I wonder if you're here and you say, Sean, uh, I haven't fought the good fight. In fact, your life is in ruins. It's uh, be an interesting thing to determine why somebody who's never come to church would come to church on a Sunday, on a holiday weekend. But God has a thing about drawing the lost. I wonder if you're here and you'd say, Sean, my life isn't what it needs to be. I don't have a relationship with Jesus and I want the opportunity to give my life to him. Today, we're going to give you the chance to do that. The the Bible says you have to do two things to become a follower of Jesus. The first is that you have to confess, and the second is that you have to profess. You have to confess that you're a sinner, and you have to profess that Jesus can change that. So we're going to give you the opportunity to do both of those things today. And here's how. In just a minute, I'm going to ask for people with nobody looking around to uh, raise their hand and make eye contact with me. Once you've done that, you can put your hand down. That's your act of confession. And second, I'm going to say a few lines in a prayer. I'm going to pause. And when I pause, if you repeat those words and you mean them in your heart, the Bible says that you will be saved. If you're here today, you say, Sean, I don't have a relationship with Jesus, but I'd like one before I leave this place with nobody looking around. Would you raise your hand? May God contact me. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Anybody else? Okay, I'm going to ask you to say these words after me. Everybody in here, say, Jesus... I've got sin in my life. Please forgive me. Change me. Make me different. Make me new. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. In Jesus' name. Amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, we would love the opportunity to connect with you, to uh, help you journey from where you are to where it is that you're meant to be, which is more like Jesus. And so you can either take the card that's in the seat back in front of you that says, hello, Tear off the bottom part, fill in whatever information you're okay with us having. Check the box that's highlighted in yellow. Put in the black buckets when they come around, or you can take it out to the Welcome Center. Or you can scan the QR code in the back of your seat or on the screen. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes one more time before we receive the Lord's tithes in your offering. I wonder if you're here and you say, Sean, I'm a Jesus guy or I'm a Jesus girl. But if you're honest, you'd say, I haven't been letting myself be poured out. You've been holding something back. And you say, Sean, I want, I want to be more poured out. If that's you with nobody looking around, would you raise your hand so that I can pray for you? Jeez. Jesus, for my friends in this place, thank you for filling us up. God, I pray that you'd pour us out. Use us as you see fit. We love you for it. In Jesus' name.